Not so good, huh? <laughs> yeah. What, if I just smile and act nice, it doesn't work? Yeah, I know. It worked all through grade school, high school, yeah. I know, I know. She's like, oh, and I'm cute too. Listen to me. <laughs> all right, I know. It sucks to... I know, well, you have... It sucks to be you. <laughs> okay, all right. All right, thank you so much. All right, I know that took a little bit of time, but that really helps me relative to where you all are coming from. We've got a, a, a lot of things that we could accomplish today, but I really want to get a few things done well. And one of those is for you all to have a, take an honest look or an honest appraisal of your practice and hear kind of in the safety of or in the safety away from <laughs> the pressures that are your practice. You can maybe get a little bit more honest. I would ask you to uh, disclose at your own comfort zone, but when you do disclose, try and push yourself to something that you might not say in your own practice, just because oftentimes, just like with families, we don't say what we want to say in our family for fear of hurting somebody. Uh, That said, the truth is the people that you are working with are not your family, and uh, many of you mistakenly believe that the people that you're working with are your, well, a couple (laughs) exceptions here. But I want to say a little bit about that because I, you know, we've talked about uh, nice veterinarians, and there's several nice veterinarians in here. And frankly, in veterinary medicine, being nice just uh, leaves you with relatively little profit margin at the end of the day, and people who will, uh, because you're nice, walk all over you. And I, and I don't know that they want to do that. I just think that it's human nature that if there are no boundaries, that we will push and push and push until we run into something. That's just how we are as people. So I want to help you create some boundaries for your practice so that you as an owner can live comfortably in your practice and hopefully be able to, uh, to give away some, uh, to delegate some authority and still feel like your practice isn't going to be run into the ground because uh, you've given away some of that authority. So help you identify some of the main problem areas, come up, show you how to come up with a plan to implement problem solving in your practice because that is the main reason that things don't get done in a veterinary hospital is really we're, we're horrible, horrible failures at implementation. We're just not good at it. And uh, there's a lot of reasons for that, and we can get into all that, but uh, uh, only if you guys bring that stuff up. Uh, questions and answers, there's not, I'm not going to have specific time, if you will, for questions and answers. So uh, at any point, and this is self-learning, you're all managers, so you shouldn't be afraid to raise your hand in a class like this, or just speak out. If I'm talking about something, you can interrupt and just say, here, I, I, I don't understand that. Where's that coming from? How do I implement that in my practice? What you'll need to hear more than anything is, if you yourselves are not comfortable comfortable with confrontation. Uh, There's not going to be any kind of panacea that I can give you that's going to make you more comfortable with that. The truth is communicating or not communicating is a choice. It is no different than, uh, uh, you know, choosing to read a book or not choosing to read a book. I may not be comfortable communicating or confronting people. It may not be my style, but that is the job description, really, of being a manager in general. In fact, if I'm a good manager, I figuratively or literally take my owner and my employees by the scruff of the neck every day and shake them a little bit and shake them into reality. And it's almost the antithesis of what happens in a veterinary hospital because we are so terminally nice. And so the, the opposite of terminally nice, though, is this: we end up with this environment where nobody tells the truth and nobody says what's really going on. And then they act it out. And it's a basic human need to want to share. And so if we don't give people information to talk about that we want them to talk about, they'll talk about what's ever on their minds and they'll make it up. And most of you have issues in your practice because people are making up their own reality. And yet, as owners or managers, we're not putting our foot down and saying, no, let me define reality for you. And so that's what we need to do is define people's reality. The other thing that you have to get used to, and I hope you can walk away from today or with today, is is that your job as a manager is not at all a popularity contest, contest. And if you are not comfortable with being disliked at some times, you really should get out of this job. If you can't get comfortable in your own skin with people looking at you and, and thinking, bitch, and thinking, asshole, then you're not really ready for this job. And if you don't get paid enough to handle that kind of resentment sometimes, then that's a, that's a conversation to have with your owner. This is not an easy job, but a good manager really protects his or her owner from having to have those kinds of toxic interactions with employees. And a good manager only has one of those toxic interactions with employees before that employee is managed up or managed out of the business. And sometimes that toxic interaction, I know, comes from the owner. And so sometimes you have to have those conversations with the owner too. The other thing about being a manager or an administrator is I think everybody today needs to make a choice about whether you have a job or whether you have a career. Because if it's a job that you have, what's important to you is staying in the same city that I've always stayed in. 
If you have a job, what's important to you is working for the same person that I've always worked for and never rocking my own world. But if I have a career, I'm willing to rock my own world. If I have a career, I realize that sometimes I push up against political realities and I may have to move on to somewhere else because the answer to everything that ails you is going to be about telling your truth and confronting the demons that are or are not existent in your hospital. And there's a political reality that the owner owns the hospital. Political reality. <laughs> and so if or uh, somebody said some of my own employees may even intimidate me. Uh, the political reality is, is that if you confront people and they are not psychologically prepared for that confrontation, they will react. And they may react in such a way that they take it out on you. And if they have more power than you, yes, you may have to go. But I think that's, but at the end of the day, you'll have some integrity because you actually did that. You'll build your own self-confidence and self-esteem. And you just heard almost everybody in this room say uh, uh, that talked about staffing, uh, except for one person, I'm having trouble finding staff. Uh, staffing is a difficult issue. The great thing about veterinary medicine is none of you will ever have to worry about having a job, ever, if you want a career. You just don't have to worry about it, especially if you live in the East Coast still blows my mind and that you can drive in three hours, you can go through five states. I mean, you live in Arizona three hours, you just get more litter box, <laughs> sand. That's what's there. I mean, it's just more and more desert. And so it takes a long time to kind of get anywhere. But if you all are willing to drive 30 miles, there's probably 100 veterinary practices that you can work at. So I think we have to get past this mentality of the place that I'm at is the only place that this is going to work for me. Because I'll give you enough tools to know if your place is irrevocably broken and you have the power to fix it, or whether or not it's something that you can change and are, are able to move forward. So I think be, uh, we're going to start in mission and vision and values. That said, we're going to, uh, in your workbook here, we're going to start on your first page, the core competency audit. And I just need to work through my slides here to get to the core, core competency audit. <clears throat> Da, 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 da. And usually we have music, but I just switched to an iMac format completely because my computer crashed like three weeks ago. I mean, it was not a good, good thing. And, and you want to just, here's the stress of my life. You'll love it. <laughs> um, two of my four employees have had major life changes, and off they go. So I'm, I'm down two staff members <laughs> at the end of this month, uh, and my computer crashed, and I moved my business. So how's that? I hate life right now, can I just say? <laughs> But I'll, I'll get through it. I will get through it, and you guys will help me with this. All right, come on back. Come on back. <laughs> Some of you are going. So if anybody wants to move to Arizona, we can talk about that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> woo -hoo. All right, a core competency audit. What I think one of the things that we have to do as managers, owners, is we really have to spend enough time managing the business. There's, there's too much time spent working in the business and not enough time spent working on the business. And we are, a veter we are an industry that prides ourselves in being doers. In other words, if we're, not, if we're not actually putting out a fire, and I would ask you this question, which most aptly describes the planning process at your hospital? We work with a specific plan in mind, or we put out fires. Okay, so which one is it? We work with a specific plan in mind. Okay, good. Somebody, or we put out fires. Okay, all right. Help dial nine one one. Lots of fires here. And so I think that this competency audit is a good way to every six months or so sit down with your staff and ask actually ask them to do this with you. So I'm going to ask you to uh, if you look in the next page of your handout. Actually, is it there? There's a place where you can do grades for this. Is it the, yeah, page nine. Page nine. So we're going to ask you to give yourselves acad academic grades in this area, anything from an A to a D minus. And uh, let's just talk about all that stuff a little bit, and we'll see where you are. This is just a, just a place of kind of looking at your business. I want you to be completely honest with yourself. And we're going to take a look at five of your most important competencies for you to achieve your mission. Now, we haven't got to your mission statements yet, but uh, sometimes just looking at what's wrong with your practice is a good place to start diagnosing. I think as a manager, your job is to look at the practice much like your clients would assume that the doctor looks at the practice when they bring their pet in. And I always use... Um, some internal medicine disease as kind of the, the uh, analogy because I don't know a lot about medicine, but what I do know is when you bring your pet to an internist, oftentimes what we're asking the internist to do is take this living thing 
and take a look at it at many, multiple different levels, views, ways, and then come back with some sort of diagnosis. And we typically come back with a diagnosis that may be right on the first time, but it might, be, it might take two or three visits, six or seven tests, and you start to rule out. Is that correct, doctor? You rule out, you rule out, you rule out, you rule out, you rule out. I think we have to train our doctor owners to understand that managing a business is much like managing an unknown disease in an internal medicine case. We are not going to fix it the first time out. And too many owners have the expectation that just addressing an issue the first time means that the problem is now gone. <clears throat> Management is an ongoing, progressive kind of job. It does, you never, in fact, if you fix every problem in your practice tomorrow, then uh, I, I just don't think that's possible. It's not real. There's always going to be problems, and there's going to be newer problems. So it's a constant process of diagnosis, diagnosing and ruling out, diagnosing in ruling out, and somehow giving your owners or the people who manage you the uh, understanding that you're on top of the disease. Doesn't mean that even if you're treating um, diabetes or Cushing's disease or something like that, that you may come in for a regular checkup and some variable changed and all of a sudden blood levels or whatever you're measuring have spiked and you're in a crisis situation again. Doesn't mean that the doctor's bad. So why is it that in management we are sometimes pinned as not doing a good job if crises pop up in the practice? So part of your job is to train the owners and the expectations of the staff. Shape the expectations of the staff just like we have to shape the expectations of the client when they bring a diseased animal into us. If, and, and you'll see the look of disappointment on their face when you tell them, you will have to come back to see me three times a year for the rest of this pet's life. They don't like it, they don't want to spend the money on it, but eventually the reality sinks in and they learn that this is a disease that has to be managed. Well, so also your practice is a disease that has to be managed. And I, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> it's an apt analogy in my opinion. And so uh, I also want to talk a little bit about the psychology of change just before we get into this because here's another thing you have to get past. Statistically, when we change something, anything at all, when we change something, most people are going to resist or resent that change. In fact, out of uh, 10 people in any given situation, you will have two people that go, yay, I like the change, I like the change. And those are the people on your staff that everybody hates. Those are the ones that people go, God, teacher's pet, they suck up to everybody, they don't live in reality, you could tell her you're cutting her pay by $5 and she'd say thank you. I mean, they're, they're oftentimes kind of the sycophant, the, the, person in the, the person in the practice that, you know, just, I, I don't know what's wrong or right with them, but they just don't seem to be bothered by anything. Okay, wouldn't be me, but that, that is those kind of people. You will have three people out of ten that probably verbally or outwardly will let you know that they are not happy with that change, uh, they don't like that change, they're not going to agree with that change, and they're gonna have to go, you're going to have to go through them to make that change happen. And then you'll have five people that on the inside are teetering either way, but almost always will succumb to the peer pressure of the person with the most influence. And that is never the Pollyanna girl or guy. It's always the one with the crappy attitude. And so you are most likely to have eight out of ten people that will outwardly resist change whenever you try to implement change. And so if your goal as a manager is to be liked and you want to change the practice, then you're headed for a bad day. It is a natural reaction when you try and change something that most of the people will go, whoa, I don't want to do it. And resistance to any kind of change is expressed through lack of motivation and lack of commitment. And some of you have said, well, I want, I want to learn how to motivate and I want to learn how to get my employees on the bus. To get my employees on the bus, I have to provide a vision for the practice for them that is more compelling than current day reality. I have to pro provide them some picture of what it could be like or would be like if they were willing to actually go through these changes and, of course, acknowledge the space that they're in. When that resistance is expressed through um, apathy or through doing it the old way, even though they've been trained how to do it the new way, it is then that you as a manager have to think about it like potty training. <laughs> That's a good analogy. How many of you have kids? Okay, yeah. <laughs> they don't let me have kids, but if they did... <laughs> And if I could potty train a child, what I would assume that would happen is the time to intervene is right when they shit their pants. <laughs> That's when we intervene. Not afterwards, not later, but right when they're doing it. But in veterinary medicine, there are all kinds of piles of dump everywhere. <laughs> and we don't clean it up. and We don't even talk about it until it's dried and dusted away. <laughs> so would you... That's good. That's kind of a fun analogy. Marnette, can we use that? Yeah? How to clean up the poop in your practice. <laughs> Literally, huh? 
Yeah, next cover of that economics. <laughs> Piles of shit to dust. Oh, yeah, and I occasionally use a curse word or two, so <laughs> anybody uncomfortable with that? Okay. Go ahead, raise your hand. <laughs> no, it's, uh, no, I'll be nicer. I'll, I'll try to. It, it just it helps me to, it's cathartic for me, <laughs> just cathartic. So I think that we have to really address kind of those elephants in the living room. And people, pe- when people are acting out, it's almost their way of saying to you, I recognize the change, I'm uncomfortable with the change, and I'm too immature, or I don't have the skills to come to you and say, I'm uncomfortable with this, and could we talk, away, talk about a way of you making this comfortable for me? So they just act out, and it's a test in the same way that a kid will test a parent when boundaries are set up. And so they know the rules. A child knows that they're supposed to go to the bathroom. They just sometimes don't want to. And so they'll literally say, I want to watch this TV and I will wet my pants instead of get up and walk to the bathroom because I want to watch this TV. And really, mom or dad, what are you going to do about it? Yes. I know that. Yeah, that's that. You know, I we'll get into a lot of that when we talk about coaching an alpha male and an alpha female. But that said, that is a political reality, and your job as the owner or the manager is to keep going to them and saying, literally, uh, if you continue to resist what I'm trying to implement, then why have you hired me? If you continue to resist what I implement, then what am I doing wrong? I need something more from you than what you're giving me. because, And we'll get into this again in the mission, vision, and values piece, but an owner really owes a practice three things. And these are the only three things, and if they can do this, then you're on the right page. The first thing they owe you is they owe you a vision for what the practice could be. That can only come from the, from the owner. It can't come from the owner's spouse. It can't come from the owner's daughter. It can't come from, I mean, it's got to come from the owner. If the spouse is an owner, then they can, they, they can help with the vision. A vision, and you saw that in your homework, but we'll talk about it more succinctly. But they, they owe a vision. Then they owe resources. They owe resources to er- carry out or to get to that vision. Resources are time. Resources are money. And resources are intellectual capacity. So they owe a loan from the bank if that's what they need, or they owe their brain, or they certainly owe time with you as a manager to discuss things. And then the third thing that they owe a practice is they owe approval or direction relative to policies and procedures. Anything other than that, then the owner should be, in my opinion, should be spending their time cutting, diagnosing, prescribing, and schmoozing. That is their job, to cut, diagnose, prescribe, and schmooze. Because quite, and the, question, the thing to say to your owner is, if you're doing this, Doc, how much money could you be making an hour if you were actually doing what you're skilled at and paid to do? <laughs> because most doctors ought to be making somewhere, I mean, most practices need to be doing somewhere between two and $8,000 a day in revenue, minimum, just to keep the doors open. And so how can that hour of time that they're spent micromanaging what you're doing, how can that possibly be in the practice's best interest? If you continue to come to your doctor with facts about how their behavior is getting in the way of your ability to manage the practice, then at some level uh, I have to say to myself, "Why why am I butting my head up against this wall? And I think sometimes as an owner or a manager I have to say to my doctor, if you continue to persist along this line, I will no longer work here. I can't be effective in a place, or why don't you just run the practice? Because clearly that is what you want to do. And if you want to do that, great. Or please change my job description, and you want me to be your personal assistant. That's what you want. You want me to babysit. You want me to pick up your dry cleaning. You want me to pick up after you. You want me to micromanage your life. And if that's what you want from me, then I want to know that so I can apply for that job if I like it, or I can go do something else. So, uh, and this question will come up over and over again, so keep asking it in the scenarios that I bring up. But in the short term, did that give you at least a little bit of an answer? Yeah, you're going to hear that a lot from me today, and it may not be people say, oh, Sean, you're a great motivational speaker, and I kind of think, motivating, okay, what did I teach you? My job sucks, get some therapy, quit. (laughs) Great, I'm a motivator. (laughs) Yes. Mm-hmm. Right. Make sure the front end runs smoothly. And then the back, the technicians have no, they have no manager either. Mm-hmm. We have somebody that does our finances. We have mm-hmm. somebody that mm-hmm. is in the office and, and does our paperwork and that kind of thing. And the girls have gone to the owner with specific problems, and it's been said, well, you've created problems. It's been turned around. 
The owner said that? Yeah. Uh, well, I, 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 and again, I don't work in the back. I'm in the front. So these are things that is brought to my attention because I've been there so long. And when things aren't getting fixed, that, that's why we are where we are. Right yeah, yeah. Do you have a vision statement at your hospital? Do you have a mission statement at your hospital? Are there core values? Is there direction provided from the owner? then it's not going to change. And so what I would say to the owner is, this is not our fault, sir, or is it ma'am or sir? (laughs) This is not our fault, ma'am. This is your fault. And as soon as you are willing to take some of this responsibility with me and help me provide direction, we can change. Until that happens, you will have chaos. Because because laissez-faire management, which is what you have, which is kind of everybody kind of do their own thing, is a recipe for chaos. It's a recipe for chaos. It is like telling everybody, drive on the street whatever way you want to drive, at whatever time you want to drive, and if you come to an intersection, just guess who's supposed to go through first. And wonder how many crashes there will be. I personally do not like traffic laws because I think I'm above those laws. (laughs) But it's a good thing for you all that they exist. (laughs) Because if they didn't, I'd run your ass over. (laughs) If they didn't, I would hurt small children crossing the street. It's because, I, I mean, literally, because it says, we'll take your license away, Sean, if you get three tickets in X amount of time. I mean, that hasn't happened yet, but it could. That's what keeps me from going 75 in a 45-mile-an-hour zone. It, honestly, I'm a speed driver. I'm a driver, literally. I like, I like to just pass people on the road just to watch them go. <laughs> I just like it. I, and that's my nature. And a lot of, uh, so I think that, there has to be some rules. There has to be some structure. And so I think that... Correct. That is part of leadership. That is part of structure is having a leader. Corporate practices get a bad name. We've got one VCA representative here that I know of. I think um, if you look at VCA hospitals, you can say what you want about VCA. They may have their cultural issues because they're a big practice, but they get shit done for the most part. And you don't get away with anything at VCA because everything is measured. Everything is measured. And there may be too much emphasis on numbers, and it feels like bureaucracy. That's because people aren't getting enough of the mission and the vision and the values. Too much of mission, vision, values, kumbaya stuff without structure leads to chaos. So the road is somewhere in between. The road is somewhere in between. Part of the, and we're gonna have, I'm going to have you coach you through how to write down some conversations. It sounds like already your fierce conversation back there needs to be with your owner. Mm-hmm. Which basically screws you because you can't see it, so it's all hearsay. Susie, can you can you be support? You know what I mean? Because I've been there so long, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. Um, I think it needs to be a whole, you know, to approach. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like the staff. Have an intervention. Uh-huh. Well, but first of all, I mean, you know, there's a lot of us that love our families but don't enjoy being with them, right. honestly. Right. And, and, and we have to get past this, this family environment thing because family is a code word for there are no boundaries here. That's what family is a code word for. I mean, think about your own family of origin. We all have a drunk uncle that has to be able to come to the wedding no matter what. <laughs> there's always the dysfunctional portion of the family that everybody's kind of embarrassed about. But you know what? They're at the family reunion. You never kick them out because they get to be there. No matter, and everybody talks about them when you get in the car on the way home. Can you believe, once again, their children are horrible? You know, everybody talks about that. But in business, it's not okay. The way we get to owners is we give them copious amounts of data about how their behavior or lack of interaction or lack of attention or lack of leadership is affecting the practice. Data, data, data. And this will be part of it here, this competency audit. Too many times as managers, you, you and I are guilty of going to the owner with anecdotal, experience-based evidence. I feel, um, I'm uncomfortable with, people are not happy. An owner doesn't want to hear that. How can you quantify whether people are not happy? The owner's happy. M- maybe. <laughs> Making their money, things are happening. I mean, for six years, they've been working like that. Pro- show them some other way that it can be done so that their way now seems illogical. Most owners are, or veterinary owners, are scientists at heart, and they, even if they have big hearts, they are still data-driven people. 
And so, you know what I think works really well with veterinarians and why I do this competency audit is I like to give veterinarians a report card. If you tell veterinarians, get something done in three days or there will be a consequence, eh, whatever. If you tell them, get something done in three days or you will get a C, D, or an F, (laughs) no veterinarian wants less than an A on anything in their life. So let's get through the competency audit and start talking about mission, vision, and values. And if either of those questions aren't answered in this process, keep asking. Okay? Yes, you're welcome. All right, so a survey of proficiency in critical areas, it requires rating of your five most important competencies for you to achieve your mission. There's, I think, uh, 19 or 20 of these areas, and in my opinion, at least five of these have to be right, but it's important to take an honest look at where your practice is at and what some of your issues are. So if you're weak in an unimportant area, forget it. If you're weak in an important area, obviously we have to fix it, and... um, Uh, All of these should be subject to review after your goals, objectives, and strategies are established. So we'll start here again, and this is a basic little swapped analysis, if you will, of your practice that you can do with your staff. I think it's a really, and by the way, if you do it, uh, do it with your management group, your doctor group, and then your frontline employee group, if you will. Typically, owners will grade themselves much higher than the rest of the staff does. Uh, The higher you are up the food chain in your hierarchy, in your practice, the better the scores you give. Uh, The scores I pay attention to are the people who are on the front line. Because often owners will go, oh, we have a B. And the staff will say, no, an F. So uh, this is a tool for breaking through denial. First area, e-commerce. Okay, now, e-commerce is just about using the Internet. It's not about selling things over the Internet, even though that, the word commerce implies that. We are reasonably web savvy. We have in place a strategy to market, purchase, and learn as it accommodates our business. We understand and use the Internet effectively. What kind of a grade would you give yourself there? And use that grade sheet on page 9. Okay, e-commerce. Give yourself an A, give yourself a B, give yourself a C, give yourself a D- minus on page 9. Did you all see that here? Okay. Because I want you to take this report card home with you and put some qualifying comments there. All right. All right. How many of you gave yourself, anybody give yourself an F? No? Anybody give yourself a D? Okay, why would you give yourself a D? Not techie? At all, no. Uh-huh. No, it doesn't understand computers. Wants to come back to using a book to make the schedule. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. Wants little note cards and everything, so when we're out of it, instead of using an inventory control system in our management. How old is he or she? 55. 55? That's not that old, really. No, she's only five years older than I am, and I love all the techie stuff, so I, it's just, she's a scientist. She would love a digital x-ray. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> you know, and an abacus for accounting. <laughs> Got it, okay. <laughs> all right. So, Uh-huh. Okay. All right. Anybody else do a D? Yeah. We're in an area where we still have no access. Okay. That's hard. So you're at the Upper Peninsula? No. Or just northern Michigan? Yeah, but dial-up would be a great thing if you had that. Yeah. Okay. Well, that makes sense. Yes. Okay. All right. Learning organization. Got to be honest about this. We have a, and this really, you can give yourself two grades here, one for the first sentence and one for the second sentence. We have a commitment to continuous learning at all levels, and it is the basis for our enhanced productivity. What grade would you give yourself there? And then the second part of that, we try a lot and keep what works, and we learn from mistakes faster than most. Current financials. This is critically, critically important. You really cannot control your business or manage your business unless you have financial statements that are coming to you. And this is, this is a person who, when I started in management, would have never believed this. But it's really the only way and oftentimes the best way to get to the owner about what the, what the reality of the business is like, is looking at financials. And so I think, first of all, uh, unless, you're, uh, unless you're a very, very small business, a one-doctor practice, maybe you can do cash basis accounting. But I think accrual basis accounting 
accounting is really, really important. Accrual basis accounts for, it gives you, a, is really accounts for quarterly pictures, not just momentary now. You may have a lot of cash at the end of the day, but if you haven't paid a bunch of bills that are coming in, you don't have that cash, you don't own that cash. And owners tend to look at cash as what I have. And the truth is, 10000 in the bank might mean you have $100 in the bank because of all these bills that haven't come in yet. So accrual-based accounting with a chart of accounts that really speaks to that really speaks to what you are measuring in your practice. Really speaks to what you are measuring in your practice. So how many of you have a budget in your practice? Okay, that's good. About uh, half of the room raised their hand. You have to have a working budget in your practice. If you don't have a working budget in your practice, that it has to be the first thing that you do when you get back home. And if you don't know how to do a budget, it's as simple as this. Take the money that you made, and you can start one starting June 1st for the, next, for, the, for the last half of this year. You take what you did from June 2007 to the end of June, or till the end of December 2007, and that becomes your gross revenue projection. Maybe add 10% to it, 15% on it, whatever it is that is historical growth for you, and that becomes your revenue projection. That's really all that we're looking for. All right? And there has to be some other line items, uh, how you measure things. I don't care what, what the line item is, but what goes into that has to be critically important so that you and the owner are talking about the very same things. So, uh, for example... I'm trying to look down uh, my chart of accounts here in my mind's eye, and I hope that I remember everything. Uh, You should allocate uh, 20%, or let's just say, um, really, uh, 8.5% for technician labor. 8.5% for technician labor. Now, that is just gross pay. Okay, That doesn't include the uh, overhead payroll stuff. 3.5% for reception labor. And this is not, this is, receptionists are not, are not worth less. There's just less of them compared to technicians, which is why we pay less. 6.5% for payroll overhead burden. 20%, doesn't it? Those three numbers? Yeah, I think it should add, add up to 20%. <laughs> if, huh? 18.5? Okay, then uh, 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 8.5, 3.5, uh, 6.5. What did I miss? Eight, uh, 9.5 technician labor then. Sorry about that. So that should take you to 20%. So basically, 20% of your revenue should be for non-DVM labor. The reason that we keep that we take off that 6.5% is your employees cannot control vacation costs, benefits costs, all that sort of stuff. But employees can control the actual labor dollars that they cost the company. Okay, you want to budget anywhere between 8.5 and 10% for facility costs. 8.5 and 10% for facility costs. Uh, facility costs would include snow removal, uh, uh, you know, triple net leases, cam charges, all that kind of stuff. Uh, anything having to do with taking care of the facility, your electric bill, gas bill, all of that sort of stuff, facility costs. Uh, so uh, if you build a new building, for example, oftentimes your facility costs will go to 15%, which usually means that the owner has to take money out of their own pocket to support the building, uh, building of a new, the uh, size of a new building. Yes? Uh, 6.5, what goes into that? Um, unemployment uh, insurance, workers' comp insurance, taxation, benefits, retirement plans, all that sort of stuff. Uh, Matt, that's coming next, yeah, that's coming next, uh, or in the, in the mix. Anywhere from 25 to 30% for DVM labor. 25 to 30%. And we need to share this information with our employees. So if, we, if you, get pa- you have to get past this fear that your employees will look at your budget and percentages and be able to extrapolate how many hundreds of thousands of dollars, perhaps, that the owner or doctor is making. Too bad. They deserve it. And if they're not making that, then there's something wrong with this picture. If you are a veterinarian and you are not making at least $100,000 a year, there's something wrong with this picture. It's a shame that you go to school that long, and frankly, I could have a high school degree and go out and sell Mercedes-Benz and make a quarter of a million dollars a year. So, uh, and I know a lot of veterinarians are like, well, I made 60 this year. Not good enough. We need to get you to that $100,000 mark now, you know, maybe 80, 75 very small town in North Dakota where, nothing wrong with that, but where you can buy a house for $85,000. But there aren't a lot of communities left like that anymore. If you're in the metropolitan areas that we're talking about, I would find it that you would be hard-pressed to live uh, as a professional if you're not making $100,000 a year going to school for 12-plus years. It's just ridiculous that you're not. 
So 25 to 30 percent. Why that discrepancy? Uh, most specialists are going to be in the upper end of that of that compensation, somewhere between 26 and 31 percent, including all of their benefits. And family veterinarians are going to be somewhere between that 19 and 23 and 24 percent mark. Yes. I put the emergency doctor 22 to 24 percent, yeah, including all of their benefits, and that doesn't that doesn't matter if you pay them. You can pay it on production or you can pay salary. Uh, about about three and a half to four percent of a veterinarian's compensation is going to be in the form of benefits: CE, insurance, uh, dues and fees, subscriptions, uh, vacation, and even if somebody is uh, and if somebody's on production, you don't pay them for their. Somebody's on production, you don't pay them for their vacation. If they want to take four weeks off, six weeks off, they, they eat what they kill, no pun intended. <laughs> and if you're making over $100,000 a year, um, I shouldn't have to pay you while you're on vacation. You should probably be able to budget your money to the point that you can actually go on vacation. Okay. Uh, let's see. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were raising your hand. You're just scratching your eyes. <laughs> yes. I'm including that payroll expense in the, the rest of it because it's, yeah, it, because it's such a minuscule amount compared to, I mean, usually your doctor uh, employee workforce is so much smaller than, uh, than the rest. And there's a lot of caps to benefits that stop after $80,000 in income or whatever. So uh, in, in, in terms of what you can put into a 401k or managing it, so yes. Uh, did you have a question? All right. Uh, let's see. For uh, we talked about, did I talk about facility costs? Yes. Talked about facility costs. Uh, drugs and supplies. Drugs and supplies should be anywhere between eight and twelve percent, depending on obviously if you are uh, an oncology practice or an internal medicine practice, you might be on the high end of that because a lot of your drugs and supplies are, you use a lot of medicine, literal medicine to treat your clients. If you are um, an ophthalmology practice, you might be on the low end of that. Uh, again, this would uh, this would be just your the thing. Things that you order. So if you are in charge of inventory, somebody back here in charge of environment and you work really well with your vendors, you can get things delivered to you that very next day, most times, if not same day. It just takes somebody being on top of it. Uh, supplies, general office supplies, should be about 4% of your budget. This is paper, pens, pencils, all that sort of stuff. Administration. <clears throat> Administration should be anywhere from 4 to 7% of your budget. Larger if you are an emergency and specialty hospital, or basically, I, I don't even want to say that. Let me take that back. If you have over 50 employees, <laughs> that 7% mark, then it is going to be that 4% mark. And this, folks, this well, if you open up a new facility, open up a new practice, uh, build a new building, start a new endeavor of any kind, your administrative costs are going to spike because somebody has to manage all of that. Now, here's what's included in administration because we oftentimes underfund administration woefully or owners take a cut. They take one, two, three, four, five percent for management and they sign paychecks. That's not management. Okay? Anything to do with Operations like making a schedule is not administration. The person on your, on your practice that makes the schedule, they are not an administrator. That's just part of what you have to do to run the business. That's not management. Strategic planning is administration. Okay. Anything to do with finance is administration. Budgeting, accounts payable, accounts receivable, working with vendors, setting up those accounts, uh, credit card machines, the banks, all of that stuff is administration. Is administration. Anything What falls under human resources are benefits and benefits administration, uh, employee crap issues with employees, counseling, all that kind of stuff. Payroll. Payroll is part of human resources. Okay. IT, the IT infrastructure and the maintenance of the IT infrastructure, your computer software, your computer hardware, all of that falls under administration. Drug supply and inventory. So your job as counting inventory, do you do that full time? Okay, so how many hours a week? So for you, we would divide your hours. If you're spending it doing tech time, that hours gets, uh, those hours get applied to technician labor. If we're doing the rest of it, it gets applied to, that's a management expense. It's an administrative expense. So anything to do with drugs and supplies? 
anything to do with facility upkeep? Okay. So uh, literally, if your employees are going to clean the building, building you might want to put under operations, but the management of the people who clean the building, that is administration. The rent space for your office manager goes under administrative expenses, for example. The office for the doctor outside of the area where they're working in the pharmacy, that is an administrative expense. Uh, working with legal and accounting people, that's, that's an administrative expense. So, yes? Where do you, uh, in your payroll figures, where do you operational staff go? Operational staff? Give me an example of what you call an operational staff. Building maintenance. Yes, uh, okay. Building, building maintenance is... Uh, Cleaning lady, cleaning lady. It you can put it wherever you want to. It either goes under labor, and then you add an additional, you know, half a percent for your labor costs, or you put it into admin, and you make sure that you, it falls in that four to seven percent, your administrative costs. Uh, I like to put it in administration because typically my employees do not want to manage the cleaning of the hospital. They just don't. It's a get, you know, it's a benefit of being a healthcare worker. You don't think that. In fact, I find a lot of technicians who are not insulted by having to clean as they go, but having to clean bathrooms and and do all that sort of stuff. It, you know, who went to school to do that? Quite honestly. And so, if we're going to outsource it, that's fine. But uh, I want administration to have to be able, to be able to control those costs, not uh, depend on my employees to control those costs. All right. Okay. So that's true. Accounts payable. Accounts. For, oh, marketing and public relations. Now, marketing and public relations, add a, that's another 2 to 3% of your gross revenue. So to create marketing uh, materials is an administrative function. To print the brochure is a cost of doing business. So the, the printing of the brochures is a direct operations cost. The creation of the brochures is administrative. How I'm going to use those brochures is administrative. Okay. The creation of the website, if you will, is an administrative cost. <clears throat> the, the putting the website up, building the, or, you know, actually calling the IT guy out there, that could be that you could charge that to operations if you wanted. And again, how you make these percentages work, I don't care. It's just you have to compare apples to apples. Uh, so 2 to 3% for marketing and public relations. That includes internal marketing. Internal marketing are things like celebrating employees' birthdays, uh, take, buying pizza for people, uh, you know, everybody gets a day off because we love you. Here's a gift certificate to Starbucks, that kind of stuff. Was there a question somewhere? Yes. Um, yeah, you, when you create a website, or sure, or something, that's something that you normally have to outsource, but you'd include that cost in your 4 to 7%. Yeah, the creation, yeah, the, even if you hire an outside consultant to do it, that gets charged under administration because it's not, a, it's not an operations function. Somebody on the team can't really do that. So you're saying all of that together should still be less than 70%. Absolutely. And that is for a large practice, 50, you know, a practice that is uh, uh, 50 or more employees. Again, if everything is running smoothly, you throw a hiccup into that, like you hire a new employee in administration that doesn't know his or her job or a new hospital administrator, your, your costs are going to spike in administration because of the learning curve. You have a doctor or doctors who, aren't, who don't play well in the sandbox with others and refuse to manage or influence employees, your administrative costs are going to go higher. As a matter of fact, that is another tool to use with your owner. Our admin costs are running at 10%. I could bring our admin costs down to 7% if you, the doctor, would get on board this bus and actually administer this practice. Um, let's see. Legal and accounting fees will be 2% of your budget. You've got to have contracts for people. got to have an attorney. Uh, got to talk to an accountant. Somebody's got to do the taxes for your practice. Uh, let's see. Where else, what else have I thought of and not thought of here? Um, going down my little wish list of things. Oh, 15% return on investment, ROI. <laughs> what the owner should get back out of every dollar that's spent, 15%. Um, <clears throat> I think I've hit a lot of the major areas. Drugs and supplies, I don't, I think. Well, you mentioned legal and accounting under admin, and you said that they weren't so. Started. Well, yeah, legal and accounting, like setting up relationships with those accountants and talking with those accountants and calling them on the phone, you know, that's admin time, working with them. Right. But if they bill us for something, that goes under a separate legal and accounting fee. Because sometimes the owner will say, I want, we, we're hiring three new doctors and I want contracts for them. I mean, you can't, the time that admin spends working on that, that gets charged to administration. The actual fees that come from the accountant or the attorney goes, goes to legal and accounting fees. Yes? Bookkeeping is accounting. That's all part of finance, and it goes, yep, it goes under administration. All right. All right. 
And um, at, just hold on to what I've just told you there. And at our break, I've got a pie chart that has kind of all this stuff broken out, and I'm just trying to come up with it off the top of my head. I'll look at it, and we'll come back to this, and I'll make sure that I didn't, that I didn't miss any line on it was on the budget. Because I want you to be able to go home and at least start take your budget that you have and start putting whatever those numbers are into these line items so that you can start to measure. Yes? Uh huh. But we're one of the few practices in northern Michigan right now that's actually seen an increase in growth for the first quarter. God bless you. <laughs> we're talking to other practices that have seen 9 to 20% decrease in growth. Uh huh. How do I incorporate that into our budget? Because I don't know. We've never. The increase or the decrease? I'm sorry. Decrease? decrease? Yeah, I think you want to at least try and keep it and, and try and. Keep it steady. I mean, I, I, I don't. I think it's demoralizing almost from the start to come. To I guess you could come in and if you can predict that you're going to see a decrease, I, I would. I would certainly want to account for that. And if you think five percent, then go ahead and do that because that'll that'll help. Just I, you have to use your best educated guess. Uh, you would approach it the same way you would any other budget and just. Bring, this way, if you get that big number right, then all your percentages just have to fall into line, fall into line, fall into line. So, yes and yes. Yeah. Okay, you got to look at other indicators to also, I mean, obviously at the end the bank manages accounts, mm-hmm. but your business may not be doing it as well. You can increase your fees, your clients pay for the fees, but now you have less, less office visits. Right. So it's actually down. Right, right. That's a good point. Good point. Who had a question over here? Yes. Uh-huh. Yes. No. No. It's a tool. Exactly. No, I agree with you. The, the budget is just a tool to. It does two things. It measures whether or not the product you're offering to the public is being accepted. <laughs> it measures uh, the extent to which your efforts, that your your systems you're putting in place in your practice are being uh, are being effective. And really, it's a tool to look at uh, where you need to make change. See, what happens is we tend to not. We you said we manage by putting out fires. A budget is a way of. Catching the fire, catching the flame before it's a huge fire. So if I'm looking at my budget numbers at least once a month, and for my employees almost twice a month, it's like we would put out a report that basically says your labor costs are unfavorable every two weeks, or you know your labor costs are good, good job, or your labor costs are unfavorable. What are you going to do about it? Because you have to manage the budget now so that you can have quarterly snapshots of of of, of something that looks good. Oh, another thing in your budget: a half a percent of your gross revenue for gain sharing. I want to talk about that a little bit later, but uh, I want to at least make a note of that. So back to the grades. Is it time already for a break? It cannot be. Well, <laughs> shit the bed. Okay. Uh, 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 question back there. I think incentives and bonuses are great, and we're going to talk about gain sharing. Okay. Uh, I want to get through the practice audit, and then we'll take a break. Okay. Are you guys cool with that? Mm-hmm. All right. Is a good idea for um, a task force to set up a task force in your hospital and have your committee members work on the problems there. And I'll, sh- I'll give you that process of problem solving this afternoon and uh, literally get them involved in fixing the things in your practice so that you can raise this, uh, this report card. I would also ask you to quantify what are the five most important things in there. Go through that and say these are the five most important things to our business for its success. It's another thing to take back to your owner and say to him or her, here are the areas I think we need to be working on. Here Here's why, and look, our grades suck, or they don't. So uh, I know I went too long. It is now 1030, correct? Yeah. So uh, let's take a 15-minute break, and then we'll come back. All right. So why do you have to have a strategic plan, and why do we start here? Because this is the silent scream of everybody in your practice. Where are we going, and how are we doing? That's what everybody wants to know. And if you don't tell people how they're doing and where they're going, they will begin to make it up. I've said that over and over again. And so part of your job as a manager, when things get tough, it is the manager's job and the leader's job, really, to focus on the vision, focus on what the practice is, and keep reminding people about why they are there. 
So it really starts at the top. Do the leaders in the practice agree that this is the course of action to take? And I think that's a message you have to take home to your owners. Is this, is how, we have to, is this how we want to manage our practice? There is a strong message, uh, a strong argument to be made for managing, by pract- managing your practice this way. You don't start with middle mag- management and you don't start with the lower workforce. It really has to start at the top. And so those of you that are questioning um, whether or not your owner is going to be on board with this, I would go home to them and say, you sent me to this retreat. Here's what I learned. (laughs) If you're really not on board with this, that's great, but I would suggest then that you continue to be a dictator and manage this like a benevolent dictator would because you don't need me. You don't need me. So we start with core values. Now, this is an exercise that you probably need an outside facilitator to come into your practice and help you establish this because values are things that people argue over. They have a hard time describing. Uh, Values are meant to stir up people a little bit. It takes really a good three or four hours of your time to define not only what your values are, but then how we're going to describe, how we're going to share those values in the workplace. So we're going to look at them, and I'll tell you a little bit about what they mean. Their fundamental ethical, moral, business, professional beliefs. So what are your, just your, fun, your gut, why did you, what makes your heart sing, if you will? What allows you to get up in the morning? What allows you to look yourself in the face? What are your values? Because the price that people pay for not living within their value system is twofold. One is it erodes our own self-confidence. When we don't live in our own value system, we essentially abandon ourselves. Much in the same way a parent abandons a child when they don't pay attention to the child. You abandon yourself when you don't live within your own value system, and the price you pay is eroding of self-esteem and self-confidence, and also Also, you literally pave the way for employees to make up, if you will, what the rules are about how we're supposed to play with one another. What core values do is this. They form the basis for desired personal conduct and interpersonal relationships. How do we want everybody to play in the sandbox? Because none of us are going to come to work and say, my core value is to be obstinate. My core value is to be insubordinate. My core value is to be always right and everybody else is wrong. My core value is I cry when you say something I don't like. Most people don't believe that that's their core value, even though that's the way that they act. Most people are going to say things like compassion, teamwork, excellence. Okay? And then you have people describe those things, and so you end up with these platitudes on your wall. Respect. We will treat each shareholder with respect and settle for nothing less. Excellence. We will settle only for excellence in all that we do and the way in which we do it. Uh, Communication. We will communicate in a timely and effective manner so that no one is left out of the loop and everybody feels a part of the team. Those are just statements of core values from some practices. Now, those are the things that we put on the wall. Core values are lasting. They last the organization forever. The reason we ask the employees to help us create the core values is because, again, they have a hard time resisting what they have helped create. It also gives me a tool when that employee comes back to me and they've just walked past that animal sitting in its own waste. You can go back to them and say, please help me understand what part of excellence this is. I don't get it. Or when that doctor that thinks they rule the roost uh, throws something across the room to express his or her frustration, you can go to them and say, how am I going to explain this as respect to our employees? What part of respect is throwing a surgical tool at somebody? Because we need, just like, and again, they don't let my people go to church, but if they did, (laughs) I would assume that what... (laughs) I know, they do. They make funny little churches for us with triangles on it. (laughs) The Metropolitan Community Church of the Queers. <laughs> That's where you get to go. I know. I just, I, it's a leather political feeling I have. It's don't ask, don't tell. There's lots of them in your service, too. Lots, lots. They just don't tell, right? And we're kicking them out, too, even when they speak Arabic. Yeah. The, my little cousin said, I don't want to go into the army, Sean. Well, just tell them you're gay. <laughs> <laughs> I said, Seriously? He called me and said, well, would there be some sort of test? (laughs) I said, have him call your uncle. You'll pass. (laughs) Hey, Miss Thang, what's up? (laughs) 
They govern, they provide direction in making strategic operational decisions. For example, once we have our core values kind of on the wall and in the books, if I, if these two as a management team have a disagreement with Dr. Miles, who's the owner of their practice, if all three of them have completely different ways to coming at a problem, then they don't subjectively figure out how to do it anymore. They look to their core values and they say, which one of these decisions most correctly or definitively supports our core values? And that is the decision we make. And if people don't stick, don't want to go there, then the core values are bullshit. Then they are meaningless. Really, you cannot, like, you, basically when our presidents don't practice our constitutional core values, most of them get impeached. That is the route that we take with them. So there, it's a system of checks and balances, if you will, for your hospital. It's like the social contract that everybody makes with one another. The other helpful tool with core values is I can hand out my core values and their definitions to potential employees. And I can say to them, here's what we're all about in a nutshell. It's the same thing as if you passed out the beliefs of your church to somebody before they came to church. Uh, uh, Orthodox Jewish people wouldn't feel comfortable in a Catholic church. Why? Because the values are different. Catholics wouldn't feel comfortable in a Pentecostal church. Why? Because their expressions and their norms are different. And so we define those things for people So because church isn't definitive enough. Church can mean anything, just like veterinary hospital can mean anything. But ABC Veterinary Hospital that has these values, now that's defined. Now, values can, can also um, be confusing if they're not backed up, if you will, in the workplace. The litmus test of values is they're clear in understanding to all people and they're not incongruent. For example, we can't have a core value of communication and not, then not have a budget and share the budget with people. Because basically we keep people in the dark. We can't have a core value of communication and not have job descriptions. We can't have a core value of compassion and then not have a policy for what do we do with people that don't have enough money. See what I'm saying? We can't have a core value of we treat every pet that walks through this door and then not charge the people at the high end of the socioeconomic scale. Because those are the people who, quite frankly, just like our taxes, are going to fund the people that can't afford things. Those are values. Values always require that you make some sort of choice. And veterinarians and veterinary employees, by the by, the paradigm is, we like to not have to make a choice. In fact, many of us say, well, I just don't, I'm not a conflict person. I don't do conflict. Well, then you don't do people is what you don't do. And we ought to be working in a place where widgets are what we manufacture and we never have to talk with people. They should represent the culture, the management style, how we get things done, and it should unify the organization in pursuit of its purpose. So, core values describe the most important personality attributes or character traits of the individuals working in the culture. Okay, they're clear and meaningful, they're complementary, they foster trust and lasting relationships. So, leaders owe a clear statement of values to the organization. They should be broadly understood and agreed to and should shape the individual's and corporate life. All that corporate means, again, is structure. Don't let that be a four-letter word for you. So basically, when I look at the core values on the wall, it should change my behavior if it needs to be changed or motivate me to take a look at how I'm living. Again, I'll use the Christian faith as an analogy. The Ten Commandments, if you will, or the golden rule is kind of what Christians use for this is how we ought to be living. And so in true, using, following that analogy all the way through, it is the pastor's job or the rabbi's job at a church to kind of lead, to, to lead the flock, to be the living embodiment of the values of that church. So also it is the doctor's job, in my opinion, especially the owning doctor's job, to, or the owner, to be the living embodiment of those values. It is the manager's job to be the police. It's the manager's job to be the deacons. It's the, whatever you want to call it. The manager is the one that says, this didn't work out so well and I need to hold you accountable for your behavior based on these values. It's the owner who basically, or the leader, who encourages people to get back right on the ship and, you know, I know it's all going to work out. I know that Marty's mean, sometimes at Marty, but boy, she's got rules to follow and we have things we got to get done here, but, you know, stick with me and I'll make it all okay. It is not the doctor's job to undermine the manager by saying, well, I'll take care of that and I'll go talk to Marty about that. That is not supporting Marty. You turn your, do- your managers into eunuchs if you do not allow them to make decisions. But if they have values that are equal to yours and you're the owner or similar to yours and you have a budget and you have a strategic plan, how wrong can your manager go? Honestly. 
Because if you want to micromanage the what your manager does, then you don't really need a manager. You need, again, a babysitter. I don't care what my manager does or how they even get it done as long as they know why I want it done and that they know that I want it done. If they're living within my core values and our core values, if they're operating within the confines or restraints of a plan and some goals, and if they are um, operating within the confines of a budget, then I, as an owner, ought to be able to go, what's the worst thing that can happen? You know, not much. Every quarter I sit down and talk with them because that's my job is to coach that manager and look at them and say, you know, budget's working, rules are working, great, no problem. Now, I wanted to find for you also uh, the difference between um, rules and standards and policies because I think we need to have all three of them in our hospital. A rule is an absolute, something that cannot be broken. Rules are not negotiated, folks. Many of you don't have enough rules in your hospital. Rules are just like the traffic laws. You know, well, actually, more than traffic laws, rules are like uh, things that you get sentenced for. <laughs> so rules are standards that cannot be broken or there will be a consequence, and you know what the consequence is. Policy directs our behavior 